On June 14, 2015, in Greene County, Missouri, police found the body of Claudine Dee Dee Blanchard lying on the bed in a pool of blood from 17 stab wounds to the back and neck. There was no sign of her 23-year-old daughter, Gypsy Rose, who apparently had chronic conditions including leukemia, asthma, and muscular dystrophy, with the mental capacity of a 7-year-old due to brain damage as a result of a premature birth. When Gypsy Rose and her boyfriend were later arrested, the details of this case would shock the entire country. Welcome to History's Biggest Villains. <laughs> Gypsy was born in July 1991 when Dee Dee was 24 and her father Rod was 17. Shortly after her birth, the couple separated when Rod realized he got married for the wrong reasons. Dee Dee begged him to return, but he didn't, so she took her newborn daughter to live with her family. According to Rod, by the time Gypsy was three months old, her mother was convinced she had sleep apnea and began taking her to the hospital, where repeated overnight stays with a sleep monitor and rounds of tests found no sign of it. Dee Dee then became convinced that Gypsy had a wide range of health issues which she attributed to an unspecified chromosome disorder. At one point, her mother even claimed that Gypsy had muscular dystrophy and made her use a walker. Gypsy said that when she was seven or eight, she was riding on her grandfather's motorcycle when they were involved in a minor accident where she got an abrasion on her knee. The doctors gave her a wheelchair that her mother forced her to use for years. Gypsy seemed to stop going to school after second grade, possibly as early as kindergarten where her mother homeschooled her supposedly because of her illness. Gypsy managed to learn how to read on her own using Harry Potter books. Around this time, Rod had remarried and Dee Dee had moved in with him and his wife Christy. They later said that when preparing food for Christy, Dee Dee poisoned it with Roundup Weed Killer, giving her a chronic illness. During that time, Dee Dee was arrested for other minor offenses, including writing false checks. When Dee Dee's family began to confront her about how she treated Gypsy and was suspicious about how Christy got ill, Dee Dee left with Gypsy for the New Orleans suburb of Slidell. Christy's health returned to normal shortly afterwards. In Slidell, her and Gypsy lived in public housing. They paid bills with Rob's $1,200 monthly child support payments and public assistance that Dee Dee was on due to her daughter's medical conditions. They saw many specialists, mostly at Tulane Medical Center, and the Child's Hospital of New Orleans. Seeking treatment for the illnesses Dee Dee claimed that Gypsy had, which now included hearing and vision issues. While a muscle biopsy found no sign of muscular dystrophy, Dee Dee was able to secure treatment for Gypsy's other issues. After she told doctors that Gypsy had seizures every few months, they prescribed her with anti-seizure medications. Several surgeries were performed on her during this time and Dee Dee would constantly take Gypsy to the hospital for minor ailments. After Hurricane Katrina destroyed the area in August 2005, Dee Dee and Gypsy left their apartment for a shelter in Covington set up for people with special needs. Dee Dee said Gypsy's medical records, including her birth certificate, were destroyed in the flood. One of the doctors in the shelter started talking to Dee Dee, and she became charmed with Gypsy in the shelter. When I first met her, I had to cry a little bit, and she goes, It's okay, you're only human. It was, apparently, her who suggested that the Blanchards move to Missouri. The story of a mother and disabled daughter left with nothing proved irresistible to local news outlets. It worked on charities too. Dee Dee and Gypsy were airlifted to Missouri in September 2005, where they rented a house in Aurora. During their time there, Gypsy was honored by the Oli Foundation, which advocates for the rights of feeding tube recipients, as its 2007 Child of the Year. In 2008, Habitat for Humanity built them a small house with a wheelchair ramp and hot tub. The community saw Dee Dee's situation and pitched in to help her. In Louisiana, Dee Dee and Gypsy stayed several nights in Ronald McDonald houses during medical appointments. In Missouri, they received free flights to see doctors in Kansas City, free trips to Walt Disney World, and backstage passes from the Make-A-Wish Foundation to Miranda Lambert concerts, where she frequently took pictures with Lambert. Rod also continued to make monthly child support payments during this time, as well as sending Gypsy gifts and talking to her on the phone. He continued to send gifts even after Gypsy turned 18 because Dee Dee said Gypsy still required full-time care. Rod and his second wife hoped to get to Springfield and visit Gypsy sometime, but for a variety of reasons, Dee Dee always changed plans. She told her neighbors in Springfield that Rod was an abusive drug addict and alcoholic 
who never came to terms with his daughter's health issues and never sent them any money, even though that's a flat out lie. Dee Dee regularly shaved Gypsy's head to mimic the appearance of a chemotherapy patient, allegedly telling Gypsy that since her medication would eventually cause her hair to fall out anyway, it was best to shave in advance. Gypsy often wore wigs and hats to cover her baldness. When they left the house, Dee Dee often took an oxygen tank and feeding tubes with them. Gypsy was fed Pediasure well into her 20s. Dee Dee also tightly held her hand in the presence of others. When Gypsy said something that suggested that she wasn't sick or that she was actually smarter than her mother was letting on, her mother would squeeze her hand very tightly. When the two were alone, Dee Dee would strike her with open hands and a coat hanger. Dee Dee also had some of Gypsy's saliva glands treated with Botox and extracted all together to control her drooling. Gypsy claimed that her mother would induce drooling by using an anesthetic to numb her gums before doctor visits. Remember, her mom is a nurse's aide, so she has some type of medical knowledge. The lack of salivary glands, along with side effects from the anti-seizure medication she was given, caused Gypsy's teeth to decay to the point where they had to be pulled. Tubes were implanted in her ears to control her supposed multiple ear infections. Bernardo Flasterstein, a neurologist who saw Gypsy in Springfield, became suspicious of her muscular dystrophy diagnosis. He ordered MRIs and blood tests, which found no abnormalities. I don't see any reason why she doesn't walk, he told Dee Dee on a follow-up visit after seeing Gypsy stand up on her own weight. Flasterstein noted that Dee Dee was not a good historian. After contacting Gypsy's doctors in New Orleans, he learned that Gypsy's original muscle biopsy had come back negative, undermining Dee Dee's reports of muscular dystrophy as well as her claim that all Gypsy's records had been destroyed by Katrina. He suspected Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Dee Dee eventually stopped taking Gypsy to see him. Flasterstein didn't follow up and report Dee Dee to social services. He said other doctors doubted the authorities would believe him anyway. What? In 2009, an anonymous caller told the police about Dee Dee using different names and birth dates for herself and her daughter, and also suggested that Gypsy was in better health than her mother claimed. Officers who performed the wellness check accepted Dee Dee's explanation that she lied to make it harder for her abusive ex-husband to find him, and that Gypsy seemed genuinely mentally disabled. The file was closed without any input from Rod. Since 2001, Gypsy had attended science fiction and fantasy conventions, sometimes in costume, since she can blend into their diverse and inclusive communities in her wheelchair. In 2011, she met a man at a science convention and they began messaging online. At the time, Dee Dee was leaving everyone with the impression that Gypsy was 15, even though she was actually 19. The man in question was 35. He took Gypsy back to his hotel room. Dee Dee managed to find them. She apparently knocked on the hotel room door with papers that showed that Gypsy was a minor and the man let her leave. Afterwards, Dee Dee smashed her computer with a hammer and threatened to do the same with her fingers if she ever tried to escape again. She also kept Gypsy leashed and handcuffed to her bed for two weeks. Sometime around 2012, while continuing to use the internet after her mother had gone to bed, she met Nicholas Gordajan, a man around her age from Big Bend, Wisconsin, whom she had met on a Christian dating site. Gordajan had a criminal record for a decent exposure and had a history of mental illness. He is also autistic. In 2014, Gypsy confided in her 23-year-old neighbor, Aaliyah Woodmansey, that she and Gordajan had discussed eloping and even chosen baby names. Gypsy, who had five separate Facebook accounts, and Gordajan flirted online, with their messages sometimes including BDSM, which Gypsy has since claimed was more of what he was interested in. Woodmansey even tried to talk her out of it, still thinking Gypsy was too young and possibly being taken advantage of by a minor. She considered Gypsy's plans fantasies and dreams, and nothing like this would ever really happen. Despite Dee Dee's efforts to prevent her from using the internet, even destroying her daughter's phone and laptop, Gypsy maintained contact with Aaliyah, who saved printouts of her post until 2014. The next year, Gypsy arranged for Gordajan to meet her mother in Springfield. Her plan was for him to just bump into her while she and Dee Dee were at a movie theater, both of them in costume, and apparently strike up a relationship that way, and then later for her to introduce him to her mother. As soon as they did meet in person for the first time, Gordajan says, Gypsy led him to the bathroom where the two had sex. The two continued their internet interactions and began developing their plan to kill Dee Dee. In June 2015, after Gypsy and her mother had returned home from a doctor's appointment and Dee Dee had gone to sleep, Gypsy let Gordajan in the house after previously giving him the layout of her home. She also gave him duct tape, gloves, and a knife with the understanding that he would use it to kill her mother. Gypsy hid in the bathroom and covered her ears 
to drown out her mother's screams. Gorda John then stabbed Dee Dee 17 times in her back while she was asleep. Afterwards, the two had sex, and then they took off with 4000 in cash from a safe in Dee Dee's house. They fled to a motel outside Springfield where they stayed a few days. During that time, they were seen on security cameras at several stores. Gypsy said that at this point, she believed the two had gotten away with their crime. They mailed the murder weapon back to Gorda John's house in Wisconsin to avoid being caught with it, then took a bus back. Several witnesses who saw the pair noted that Gypsy wore a blonde wig and walked unassisted. In the days after the murder, alarming messages were posted to Didi's Facebook page including, That bitch is dead. And, I fucking slashed that fat pig and raped her sweet innocent daughter. Her scream was so fucking loud, lol. After reading these posts, the Blanchard's friends and family suspected something was wrong. When phone calls went unanswered, several friends and family went to the house. Kim Blanchard, a neighbor, called Dee Dee's number, but there was no answer. Kim's husband, David, suggested that they drive over to the house just to make sure everything was okay. When they arrived, a crowd of worried neighbors were already there. The windows had a film on them, so it was hard to see inside. Knocking on the doors brought no response. But everyone found it suspicious that Dee Dee's new van was still parked in the driveway. Kim called 911. The police couldn't enter the home without a warrant, but that didn't stop David from climbing through a window. Inside, he saw nothing wrong. All the lights had been turned on and the air conditioning was on high. There were no signs of a robbery or any struggle. All of Gypsy's wheelchairs were still in the house. The police began taking statements while they waited for a search warrant, which didn't come until 10.45 that night. The police found Dee Dee's body in the bedroom. She'd been stabbed and had been dead for several days, but there was no sign of Gypsy. The next day, Kim organized a vigil and a GoFundMe to take care of Dee Dee's funeral expenses and possibly Gypsy's. Everyone feared the worst. All her life, Gypsy had evoked protective responses in people. She was so small and looked so helpless. Many people couldn't understand why this had happened to her. Who could prey on someone who had no defenses? Gypsy's old friend Aaliyah provided police with the printouts of her conversations with Gypsy especially about her boyfriend Nicholas Gordajan, which police determined the IP address of the Facebook post led to his house. On June 15th, a team of officers in Waukesha County, Wisconsin, were dispatched to Gordajan's house. The standoff was brief, but Nick quickly surrendered. Luckily enough, Gypsy was with him unharmed and in excellent health. It turned out that in fact, Gypsy hadn't used a wheelchair from the moment she left her house a few days earlier. She didn't need one. She could walk just fine. There was nothing wrong with her muscles, and she had no medication or oxygen tank with her either. Her hair was short and spiky, but she wasn't bald. Her head had simply been shaved all her life to make her appear sick. She was very well spoken. The disabled child that she'd long been in the eyes of others was nowhere to be found. It was all a fraud, she told the police. All of it. Her mother made her do it. After Gypsy revealed how her mother had treated her, sympathy for Dee Dee as the victim of a violent murder rapidly shifted to her daughter as a victim of child abuse. While the charge of first degree murder carries the death penalty under Missouri law or life without parole, prosecutor Dan Patterson announced that he wouldn't seek it for either Gypsy or Gorda John, as the case was extraordinary and unusual. After her attorney obtained her medical records from Louisiana, he secured a plea bargain to second degree murder for Gypsy. In July 2016, she accepted the plea bargain and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Gorda John, however, still faced more severe charges because prosecutors contended that he initiated the murder plot and he and Gypsy agreed that he was the one who killed Dee Dee. As a part of the plea bargain, Gypsy did not have to testify against Nicholas. In January 2017, his trial was postponed when the prosecutors required a second psychiatric exam as his lawyers contended that he had an IQ of 82 and is on the autism spectrum, suggesting that he has diminished capacity. The judge sent Gorda John's trial for November 2018. In their opening statement, the prosecutors alleged that Gorda John was the mastermind, while his lawyers pointed to his autism and said that Gypsy had planned the crime and Gorda John had just done as she asked. The next day, prosecutors showed jurors the text messages that Gypsy and Gorda John shared in the week before the murder, often using various aliases, as well as the knife he used to kill her mother. In some of the text, he asked her for details about Dee Dee's room and sleeping habits. These were supported by the videos of his interview with the police where he admitted to killing her. Gypsy testified on the third day of the trial. She said that while she had suggested to Gorda John that he killed Dee Dee to end her abuse, she had also thought about getting pregnant by him in the hope that once she was carrying his child, Dee Dee would have to accept him. Along with the knife that she gave to Gorda John, 
She stole baby clothes from Walmart during a shopping trip so that she could go ahead with either plan. However, Nicholas never told her what he thought about the pregnancy plan. On day four of the trial, the case was sent to the jury. After two hours deliberation, they returned with a verdict and Nicholas was found guilty of first degree murder in armed criminal action. In February 2019, he was sentenced to life in prison for the murder conviction plus 25 years for the armed criminal action charge. Dee Dee's family in Louisiana, who had constantly confronted her about her treatment of Gypsy years before, did not mourn her. Her father, stepmother, and the nephew who first shared details of Gypsy's actual health all later said that Dee Dee deserved her fate and that Gypsy had been punished as much as she needed to be. None of them would pay for her funeral and her father and stepmother flushed her ashes down the toilet. Damn, that's cold. In an interview with 2020 in 2018, Gypsy said to reporters, I feel like I'm more free in prison than with living with my mom because now I'm allowed to just live like a normal woman. While she said that Gota John took their idle discussions of murder into reality, she accepts that she committed a crime and has to live with the consequences. On September 29, 2003, the Missouri Department of Corrections confirmed that Gypsy had been granted parole and she was released on December 28, 2023 after serving 85% of her sentence. Now she is free and is telling her story all over the country. This case to me is, is kind of like a mixed bag because of course you have to factor in the fact that she was abused for all these years. But you also have to think about the fact that she convinced a guy with mental issues to murder her mother. And then the fact that they fled and they stole money and they tried to go in disguise. Like, is it really remorse or is it just you got off like you, 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 you got off lightly. Is it really remorse? Or are you just happy you got off? You know what I mean? Like, oh, I, I, I've seen so, I've seen like clips where she says, "Oh, I'm glad I'm out of my situation, but I'm just I, I'm I miss my mother. I I'm, I wish my mother didn't have to die." Well, you didn't have to. You had a you had a, you literally just said alternatives. Like I could have just got pregnant. I could have got pregnant. She would have just had to accept that. I would I would have rather you've done that than plot to kill her. And the fact that your ex boyfriend is rotting in jail while you're out living your life, giving all these interviews and talking to all these people. It's like, oh, I don't want to be famous. Well, you're when you give interviews to Good Morning America and Dr. Phil, what do you think is going to happen? Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to, 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 to like uh, talk down on what she went through because she went through some wild stuff. And that's, that's insane that a parent would do that to their child. But you can't just sit here and excuse what she did though. You can't excuse that she devised a murder plot and then provided her ex-boyfriend with all the materials and tools to murder her mom. You know what I mean? You you can't you can't take that away. You can't and it's just it really kind of bugs me that the boyfriend is in jail and is going to be in prison for the rest of his life. Meanwhile, she served 8 years and got out and she can live her life and she can do whatever she wants now, but he has to rot in jail. I feel like she kind of manipulated him in a way. It's just really weird. Like, if you were sorry, if you had remorse, why didn't you immediately call the police after your mother died? Why did you run? You know what I mean? If you really felt sorry for your mom, and you really felt like this was the only thing you could do, why did you run? You know what I mean? What's the point of running? I, I don't know. That, that that This whole situation, this whole case, like, apparently there's a documentary that's supposed to be coming out, and it's going to shed more light on this. But I just, it's like a 50-50. I'm like 50-50. Of course, it's like, I'm glad she's not going through what she's going through anymore. But it's like, the fact that your your ex, the, the guy who, the ex-boyfriend is stuck in jail, even though you're the ringleader. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like you should have served it, like, only 10 years. You know what I mean? Like, but I guess the abuse really, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a really complicated story. I can't just, I can't just, like blindly just support her i can't blindly do that when i when i look at the details of the case like when you when you when you when you look at all this stuff it's kind of hard to just be like oh you know she was justified in doing what she did it just seems really weird how like all these factors like it's not it's not a simple black and white oh her mother got killed it's like she kind of orchestrated it like she got somebody else to kill her mother and like she ran away like she fled the scene and tried to go into disguise and tried to take money and stealing baby clothes. Like she had all these other plans to get away. Like, I, I don't know. 
this whole story is weird. But, um, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, leave a like if you enjoyed that. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. Also, don't forget to turn on my post notifications if you haven't already. But, uh, I'm out. Peace.